very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 192nd episode of the Together for Education webinars brought to you by Notebook. Two and a half years back, when the pandemic raged outside our windows and schools had closed down, we here at Notebook felt it was our responsibility to set up a platform for educators to connect meaningfully on discussing problems they were facing with the rising need of digital education and online learning and arrive at common solutions. Today, 192 episodes later, this platform has grown much bigger than we could have ever anticipated, all thanks to your love and support. We have discussed extremely curricular topics here, like digital learning, NEP and assessment, extracurricular topics like sports and theater, topics like school finance and management, and even evolved topics like mental health. Today, we have a very contemporary topic, educational gap between schools. Educational gap gap between schools is an occurrence since the ancient ages. Indigenous education was imparted then at home in campus, park shalas, tolls, status studies, and gurukuls. With the passage of time and the evolution of modern education system, the stark differences have been addressed to a very large extent, I suppose. But are they fully taken care of? Let's hear from the experts today. Our first speaker on this topic is Mr. Philip Barrett. Mr. Barrett retired as a deputy headmaster from the illustrious Stone School in Izaradun after 44 years of serving in education across various institutions. Mr. Barrett served the Dune School as housemaster, head of department, dean of activities, dean of students' welfare, deputy headmaster, second master, and acting headmaster. With great distinction, he also carried out a visioning exercise for the Dune School in the year 2011 to an in-depth study of a number of British public schools and various schools in the U.S. Mr. Barrett qualified as a leadership trainer at Wellington College, UK in the year 2000. He is also an athlete, an adventurer, and a naturalist. And we here at Notebook are truly privileged to have Mr. Barrett as our senior advisor. So thank you so much for being here today. A very good evening and over to you. Thank you very much, Gagori, and thank you very much for, that, uh, for, for choosing this wonderful topic. Um, a very good evening to Achin and everyone over there at um, Notebook as well as to our panelists and our, ex and our esteemed guests who have tuned in. I'm just setting the timer so that I don't um, overshoot. Yes, the, you know, I, think, I must say that the Indian education system has some very singular characteristics. Um, I, I won't give you the statistics, but I am sure that we are a country which have the most number of students going to school. And we also have the most schools in the world, any country, no one can match us. But on the other hand, the gulf that separates the great schools from the not so good schools is also very, very wide. Uh, the education system in India, of course, has made significant progress, as Gagori just mentioned. You know, we had the Gurukul system in the early days before the British came. And I think everything was very, very uh, equal, on an equal footing there. But with the advent of the typical British public school system in India, uh, you know, classroom subject uh, allocations, the gap started to widen. And although the government has done a lot to bridge this gap, it still exists. Um, you know, um, I, I must say that in India, there's a great variety of schools. There's the government and public schools, which are funded by the government, um, which lack somehow infrastructure and, uh, you know, best teachers. Ha but having said that, uh, if you take a look at what Delhi has done, the Delhi government has done to its government school, it's phenomenal. People are pulling their kids out of private schools and putting them in government schools. So it can be, it can be done. Then, of course, there's the private schools where children who can afford that fee are sent for a private education. And lately, in the last 20 years, we've had the international schools, you know, the state-of-the-art schools, which are funded by the Ambani's and the Adani's and the Tata's and the Birla's. These are, you know, a different in a different league. Um, and of course, there's the national open school, you know, for children who have in some ways not finished their formal education. And then there are schools with the special needs for special needs children. And much has to be done on that too. Now, we are a country that's mad on education. Um, the work, we, we provide the workforce for in, the entire world. I don't think there's any country in the world where Indians aren't working and, and contributing. Um, and parents, of course, are crazy about education. They will make all the enormous sacrifices to get their children to school to better, uh, to have a better standard of living than they had. But the big difference in our schools is 
the quality of education. The first thing is the quality of education. And it's wrought with problems. Our system is wrought with problems. We have undertrained, underpaid, and, un and unsuited teachers uh, for whom teaching was never a first uh, choice job. Um, we have too many students and few, too few good schools, crowded and poorly ventilated classrooms. And of course, our country, if you look at our country, we have large tracts of forests and hill areas and deserts, you know, at the same time, and these are sparsely populated areas. And then we have metro cities with 20 million plus people in them. Again, the great demand for schooling, but too few schools to, 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 to have. Now, look at the difference in schools between the Bangalore, Hyderabad, Pune, Bombay, and look at the schools in the you know, coastal belt or you know, the deserts of uh, Rajasthan or the hills of my state, Uttarakhand, tremendous difference. Then, of course, there's the whole difference in board exams. You know, uh, you on the one hand, you have the latest IB systems and you have the state boards. Um, and, and these boards, you know, sometimes are wrought with corruption. The exam systems uh, are corrupted. Uh, there's paper leakages. Uh, you, can get, you can get anything from fake mark sheets to change birth certificates. There's marks inflation, high college cutoffs, fake attendance certificates. And there are so many unrecognized institutes. So there's huge amounts of uh, gap in this whole, you know, to the, the exam board. Of course, we have a diverse population as well. Different mother tongues, different dialects, different food habits. You know, uh, how can you compare somebody uh, for, in the Far East, you know, from Shillong or Meghalaya to the person in the South or person in Kashmir or person in Gujarat? It's so diverse. Different people want different types of education. And of course, the needs differ greatly. Now, take the socioeconomic uh, status of a, of a child. You know, a child from an affluent metro family who's definitely going to study abroad at a top university wants a certain type of school, preferably an international uh, board exam school. And yet, in a village school where the highest aspiration is, is to join the military or to run their family uh, hardware business, he requires a different school altogether. And both these kids will have schools that cater to the, their needs. Look at the syllabus. You know, the affluent kid is entering a global workforce where, you know, he has a choice of studying, uh, you know, global literature, advanced maths, uh, on par with the best syllabus in the world. And what does the need of, the, of a rural kid? He doesn't need Shakespeare and high physics. He needs farming techniques, commercial maths, practical physics, hygiene, basic emergency medicine, uh, specialized topics like wildlife protection, organic farming, hot, uh, hydroculture, uh, sorry, hydro farming, soil management, uh, the development of mini, uh, you know, power generation units. His needs are different. Then, of course, is affordability. You have in India a diverse, uh, you know, uh, the parent body. People who can afford the best send them to the affluent schools. You know, the fees I can tell you in some of the schools are 10 to 15 lakhs a year. And then you have people who can't afford even one hundredth of that. And so therefore the schools have to be, have to cater to these, to, to these um, financial, um, you know, paying abilities. Um, then of course, you know, technology, very important. Uh, the rich schools can afford the latest, uh, you know, school technology, teaching technology. And then you have schools which are just two rooms, two rooms with the minimum, uh, you know, I don't know how these schools even get recognized by, by recognized boards, not even a blackboard. Uh, it's difficult to get, get them writing material and, uh, and, and, and pencils, very poorly ventilated. And this gulf that exists is, I think, extremely unfair. Uh, it saddens me because, you know, if you look at Professor Sogata Mitra's work, he proves that village children in this country are no worse than, and they're, they're better than anyone in the world. In fact, Silicon Valley and NASA and, and all the great research institutes of the world are filled, filled with Indians. And these don't come from necessarily our top schools. They come from the government schools. These top IIT scientists who earn their money abroad are coming from government schools, schools that are literally um, a far reach away from the schools I've taught them, um, where they have to do homework under the street light, 
they are motivated they are they are they are fired up and these are the people who are thirsty for education and they just don't have the means to to to, to get to a good school um yes i do agree that the metro kids need a different type of education from a rural child a different syllabus maybe but why can't both schools have clean hygienic toilets why can't they be served equally good food hygienic good food nutritious food does it take much to 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 have uh, uh, the correct ratio of children to urinals does it have to be dirty um even the quality of teaching you know um it, it, good schools pay well the adanis and ambanis as i said or mahindra world college look at the teacher salaries there compare this to a, a village school where the teacher is not motivated to even get to class um you know i think um i would love to see um affluent schools be made to adopt couple of rural schools like we at the don school have adopted three to four rural schools and we try and upgrade them we send our teachers we send our students we 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 fund these schools we have uh, uh, invited these schools over to many of our functions we even have um, a, a, a small quota to take some of these children in to give them a, a quality world class education and if every good and affluent school takes on and adopts uh, a poor school we could really make a change um i'd also say that i mean the huge gaps in methodology in the transaction of the syllabus uh, you don't have to have fancy infrastructure you just need uh, a good good hardware and software and teachers who have been trained to use this um again you know most indian schools focus on academic subjects with little scope for creativity hardly any extra curricular activities be traditional rote based uh, schooling while the better schools have moved away from this rote based academically focused education and therefore many expats prefer to send their children to international schools where they are very progressive and they don't they they, they train the whole child not just the mind body soul values so many things um i would say better teaching uh, uh better high tech teaching uh, experiment and research based teaching modern psychological methods of handling adolescent behavior counselors special needs educators all this and actually following a student and getting him into a college of his choice that is the role of schools no matter if they are the top end or the lower end also philosophy is different the philosophy of certain schools uh, differs so much from the from other schools some just want to get their kids through an exam and pass them off while the better schools offer a holistic education as i said you know there's hobbies there's culture there's art there's foreign languages public speaking where children learn to respect the lgbt community women rights emphasize child development stages teach internationalism democracy this is what is lacking in many of our rural schools and um, I, i think they can still introduce these things i want to end by saying that schools will be different curriculums will be different paying abilities of parents will be different but why should teaching why should infrastructure why should the basic toilets and hygienes um be 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 very different um i think that um, all students rich or poor are entitled to the best quality education possible which entails appropriate skill development gender parity provisions of relevant school infrastructure good equipment education materials and resources and scholarships and a good teaching force train the teacher train the teacher i think at the end what separates the top end schools from the average or the poor schools is the quality of the teacher and uh, i think with that uh, i hope i have somewhat covered this topic it's difficult to put one's finger on why there is this big gap i think it all comes down to finance at the end of it and uh, and will thank you so much gagori and over to you thank you thank you so much sir as always you have set the stage for this wonderful topic well ladies and gentlemen our next speaker on this topic is mr achin bhattacharya
Austin is a founder and CEO at Notebook, a chartered accountant by training. Austin was a director at Deloitte prior to starting Notebook. He has worked in India and abroad in various senior capacities in GE, PwC, KPMG, and Deloitte. Austin is a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales, a fellow of the ICAI, a member of CP Australia and CP Ireland, and a member of SEMA UK. He is also the recipient of the prestigious Indian Achievers Award, an avid reader and a passionate traveler. Austin has been interested in economics, history, literature, and philosophy. He is a regular speaker at various forums and chambers of commerce and also contributes articles to numerous publications regularly. He is also on the board of some of the renowned corporates and contributes significantly to their brand strategies. Austin, a very good evening and over to you. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Absolutely. I want to welcome all of you to today's session. According to a paper by leading education academic, Professor Steve Strang of Oxford University, the stubbornness of the attainment gap across all types of school suggests that the quality of a school is not enough to overcome a disadvantaged background. So this particular paper was presented in British Education Research Association's annual conference, and it challenges the current global narrative that schools are not doing enough to close the gap between disadvantaged pupils and their wealthier peers. And I'm not discussing, uh, discussing about a national phenomenon, I'm discussing about the international phenomenon. He suggests, and he suggests this with enough evidence backed up with enough research, that factors outside school contribute much more to the gap rather than what's happening in the classroom. In fact, his research points to the fact that schools around the globe have been instrumental and have contributed a great deal in narrowing the gap. His analysis also show that performance gap, and I'm talking of UK, between students eligible for free school meals and those who are not, is remarkably consistent, no matter how the school is rated. So that means good and outstanding schools may raise the bar, but they do not close the gap. So he went out to argue that factors outside the school gate, factors at home or in the community, a peer group are much more relevant and much more far more influential. So it's not a question of blaming it, but rather recognizing the importance of other factors. For instance, children who grew up in poverty, he felt in his paper that most of them, if not all, of course, there are examples who have, who have done great for themselves, no doubt about it. And there are numerous such examples where in, you know, world leaders, legendary entrepreneurs have come from rural schools, from small towns, and they've done fantastic for themselves. And I honestly feel that talent is evenly spread. But if you look at the majority, the fact is that children who are not so fortunate very often get little parental support. First generation learners, children with broken families, and they're not able to afford either educational activities, resources, and most importantly, encouragement at home. He began his research and this particular research, he began this research with a sample size of 15,000 students. And later in 2013, he covered all schools for both primary and secondary schools in United Kingdom. And he concluded that other factors, factors outside the school gate contribute far more to the gap. He also felt that the current accountability mechanisms like comparing peer-to-peer -peer performance or field inspections fail to adequately take into account factors associated with the social background, socio-economic factors rather, and are therefore biased against schools 
who are serving the more disadvantaged sections of the society. So he therefore calls for a more re, he called for a more relevant accountability measure, which would actually be able to take this into account. And he suggested something called contextual value. And now this is being followed in surveys, in researchers across the world. And he felt it is, it is important that schools are accountable for the progress of their students relative to schools with similar intakes and not for absolute raw outcomes. So quite logically and naturally, intake also, input also needs to be considered. So this is, we discussed about one research finding. Now let me go to another one, which is very relevant in this particular case. Of course, with regard to gaps between schools, I think Pertsa gives gave us a wonderful overview. And we have a panel of very senior educators with decades of experience, who I'm sure will throw light on this topic. So I'll confine my deliberation to a more uh, a uh, holistic view of the topic. So let me tell you a story. And this one is really interesting. The story begins with the amazing journey of 100 North Carolina babies who were born into poverty, whose life trajectories were altered with a single intervention. And this research has been going on for decades. It started in the 1970s. The whole objective of this research was to, was to measure the impact of high quality educational childcare. The objective was to see, A, does it make a difference? And B, if yes, to what extent? What is the degree of impact? Is the impact confined to academic outcomes? Or does it also impact other areas of life? So that is what the researchers wanted to see. And that is, this is a very long research which went on for decades. And the story and the research deals with a very, very interesting and relevant fact. It points, it points out to this, that a healthy child does not come pre-assembled. Work is required. It's a process as complex as the most challenging feat of engineering to build and to ensure that a child is physically, emotionally, cognitively, and socially healthy. And a lot of factors contribute to it. Now, there's a particular project and this particular project that I'm discussing about is globally one of the most famous long running studies of child development the Abecedarian project. It started at the Frank Porter Graham Child Institute, Child Development Institute. The word Abecedarian means a person who is just learning and so appropriate for young participants. Since the early 1970s, scientists followed this group of 100 children to investigate how their lives differ from their peers who did not receive the same early care and education. And he volunteered for the project. And they all came from similar socioeconomic background. They were disadvantaged. They're randomly assigned to one of the two experimental groups. And both the groups received basic support, like basic childcare, medicines, etc. So that was the same for both the groups. But only the children in this particular Abbasidian group received year-round, full-time educational childcare. So that was only reserved for one group. And the other group, it received basic nutrition, medicine, but not educational childcare. Of course, they also went to school. But here the focus was far more. This innovative program was designed by researchers and implemented by early childhood teachers. And it consisted of a lot of things like playful activities called learning games that emphasize language intensive one is to one interaction between teachers and children. 
the researchers initially expected that the fruit of their efforts to be immediately apparent. So they enrolled children as young as six weeks old and started looking soon after for results. But for over a year, they found nothing. Finally, when they were around 15 months old, this group of children who were receiving educational care started to started beginning to outperform their peers on cognitive and motor assessments. But no one expected the dramatic long-term effects they would find. They thought the effects would be confined to academic outcomes or early childhood development. So first, there was some disadvantage for non-participating children who experienced decline IQ by their fourth birthday. And they're more likely, not all of them, but they were more likely to be placed in special education programs in elementary and middle school. But individuals who experienced this child care program outperformed their peers on intellectual measures and as well as reading and math assessments. And that was through high school into adulthood. Also, these childhood participants, these child care participants, when they became teenagers, they were less likely, they were less likely to be to get into drug addiction or less likely to become teenage parents. They were far more focused and sorted with regard to their academic goals. They were, they were able to take care of themselves and behave comparatively little more mature. By the time they were 21 years of age, only 40% of non-participants were attending, still attending college. They were still within the educational umbrella. Whereas 70% of the participants were attending college. So the difference is stark between 70 and 40. And as adults, it was also seen that they were less likely to experience depression. By the time they were 30, they were more likely to hold a bachelor's degree and be employed. And not only that, by the time they were in the mid thirties, it was seen they had significantly better physical health than their peers, very surprising significantly better physical health. They could take care of themselves. When their peers, they suffered from conditions like metabolic syndrome, etc., high blood pressure, obesity. But these children, they were blessed with significantly better health. Quite surprising. Maybe better lifestyle choices, etc. Now, what made a difference for them? And how does early high quality care, better educational inputs, have such a powerful and lasting impact that we're not discussing about few years, we're not discussing about school, we're not discussing about academic outcomes, we're not discussing about job prospect. It goes into health as well. So this brings us to the fundamental question that what is required to bring up a healthy child who then goes on to become a healthy adult? Researchers have spent decades investigating and identifying the features of high quality early care and education. So this study, this was an eye-opener. It was an eye-opener for researchers from around the world. We learned a lot from the study about the kind of significant lifelong impact that, that early child care, educational care can have. It also goes on to show that children need healthy environments. Now, some of these tools that have been developed in this program have been used around the world now. And we are discussing about the study we started in 1970s and went on to early 2000s. One of the greatest lesson from this study is the importance of frequent, intensive language interaction between adult and children to support healthy development. Research has shown, and this is very unfortunate. When I say this, I think this is very unfortunate in a civilized world, but research has shown that by four year old, by the time children are four year old, children who live in poverty hear 30 million fewer words than children growing up in economically privileged homes. So naturally these children, they get a head start. And I think of course, we all agree that every child deserves equal opportunity. 
but then this is what research has proved and, and we are not discussing again about a national phenomena we are discussing about a global phenomenon which also includes the so called developed countries now researchers continue to study how teachers in early childhood programs can enhance language development for young children so one thing they have established that the glue that hold this whole system together is the presence of warm and trusting relationships forged by the healthy adults in children's life and one of the things that has come again and again is that children benefited immensely from consistent enjoyable one is to one interaction with their teachers so the role that educators had and which has been proved in all these researches is been tremendously important i think that was the single most important factor that has come out of this research so we know that children who have warm trusting relationship with teachers in early childhood are more likely to go on to become healthy adults take better care of themselves pursue higher education and not only perform not only outperform their peers academically but also do well for themselves for their families and the communities they come from in later years of their life now the other aspect is i was reading about this and this is interesting if you look at the financial aspect as well now when i am discussing about financial aspect the the, the importance the benefit of investing in education ensuring that equal opportunity for all ensuring that disadvantaged sections they also get an opportunity so according to nobel prize winning economist james hickman people who received and i am discussing about this particular research again people who received this abecedarian early childhood program saved societal support program as much as 7 dollars for every dollar spent on it so that means initially if 1 dollar was spent on child care later point of time because these children become self sufficient they are able to do well for themselves for their families and their communities and they are not living on subsidies they are not living living on subsidies and doles they are able to earn for themselves do well for themselves eventually the savings for the state are seven fold another total economist Timothy Barte provides compelling evidence that investment in high quality early childhood programs will not just benefit participating children and families but entire communities and break this entire vicious cycle of poverty because somewhere somewhere this needs to be broken this chain needs to be broken now these are few thoughts that i wanted to share i thank all of you for giving me a very patient hearing but sir gave us a wonderful start and we have a very experienced panel of senior educators here with us today and each one of them come with their own decades of experience and i sincerely look forward to hear from them on this wonderful and beautiful topic i thank all of you again over to you gauri thank you thank you so much again for this wonderful deliberation so ladies and gentlemen as i've mentioned we do have a wonderful panel lined up for you today but before we start with the panel discussion and let's look at about us here at notebook we at notebook are an edtech platform that creates short videos pertaining to the school curriculum this means that every topic from every subject of the school syllabus has been converted into a series of short videos that can be used in two different pieces What is when you, as a teacher, are starting out a topic in your classroom, you can play one of these videos as a method of visually introducing the topic to your students. These videos are just six to ten minutes in duration and take up very little of your class time while offering the right kind of material to students to generate curiosity and excitement. The second is when the student is studying at home months later, they have access to the same videos on their personal devices. Either a laptop or a smartphone, they can watch the videos over and over again until they get a very clear understanding of the topic that you had taught. What I'm going to do now is play some short snippets of notebook videos so that you know what they exactly look like. 
Hello students, welcome to Notebook. Today, we will see how the Mongols created a vast nomadic empire which transformed the history of Eurasia. Genghis Khan's grandson, Monke, had warned the French ruler, Louis IX. Another grandson, Batu, invaded and conquered Russian lands till Moscow. When a coin is flipped, there are only two possible outcomes, that is, a head or tail. The probability of getting a tail or head are 1 by 2 each. That is, both the outcomes are equally likely. Rutherford produced a narrow beam of alpha particles from a radioactive source. He allowed it to strike an extremely thin gold foil. The gold foil was around 1,000 atoms thick. Most of the fast-moving alpha particles passed straight through the gold foil without any deflection. Some of them were deflected from the foil by small angles. However, one out of every 12,000 particles were deflected through large angles and some even traversed back their original path. Well, ladies and gentlemen, those are some short snippets from the notebook videos as you just now saw. We have today connected with over 3,500 schools and have had more than 44 lakh students benefit from our videos. If you head over to our website, www.notebook.school, or use our mobile app for Android and iOS, you would find more than 10,000 such videos at your disposal. With that, it is now time to introduce the wonderful panelists that we have with us today. We have with us today Ms. Madhvi Krishna, Principal Quantum Leap School, Telangana. Ma'am holds an MCA, MTech, MPhil, BA, and she is currently pursuing a PhD. She has 20 years of experience in the field of education and has worked as professor in MNM Jain Engineering College at Chennai. Ma'am has also been the HOD for Information Systems Department at BMA EB School in Bangalore and working as principal since the last 10 years. Ma'am has published books under the title Business Process Management in association with the BNA Educational Academy and has published papers in the national and international conferences. Ma'am was also a member of Curriculum and Designer for IMS Educational Institution Telangana. Ma'am, a very, very good evening and welcome to the panel. We also have with us today Mr. Vikas Jairat, Principal Hastinapur Public School, Hastinapur UP. Sir was a postgraduate in commerce with LLB in taxation and BA from CCS and a total experience of 76 years in the field of education of which 14 years as principal and 12 years as PGT commerce. During his service as principal, CDC commissioned him as a part of inspection committees of new affiliations as well as the renewal and extension of affiliations. He got the opportunity of being mentor for implementation of CC in the schools of Gajraula and Dhanaura. Sir has also been the superintendent for the main exams as well as the CTET exams of CBSC as an observer. A founder president of Sahodaya Complex of CBSC's Amroha chapter, Sir is presently the district president of All India Principals Association, a national level organization working for the betterment of education in our country. Sir is also into different social and community services like organic farming, tree plantation, women empowerment, only to name a few. Sir, a very, very good evening and welcome to the panel. I would request both the panelists to kindly unmute them. So, doesn't switch on the cameras, please. And if I come, can come to Krishna, ma'am, please. Good evening, ma'am. Yeah, good evening. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, my question to you would be, uh, ma'am, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, ma'am, uh, usually the curriculum and pedagogy remain standard across schools. But however, the standard of academic proficiency and soft skill development differs from school to school. So, how are we addressing the gap, ma'am? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Agori for you and the notebook management for giving me this opportunity. Hope I'm audible. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, see, I would first feel that the curriculum and methodologies are also not same across the country. As Philip has said, there is diversity in schools uh, across because of the different diversity in India. So thinking that the curriculum and method
uh, I would say that there should be some standard methodologies of evaluation processes, because what is academic proficiency? Ultimately, it is uh, the standard what we take to measure the child's a uh, child, uh, child's education, like how much he has understood, how much a child has understood um, from the com from the syllabus, what has been taught to you. So that is what is a measurement of academic proficiency. Now, when there is diversity in the teaching methodologies and the concepts, we should first take a measurement to evaluate a common um, examination pattern is my opinion. Uh, thinking that it could be something like a hybrid model, uh, wherein you build up an examination pattern depending on the contempt development process, which could be a theoretical type of examinations, which generally most of the schools do, which consists the examinations should be a theoretical depending on the concept based knowledge of the school of the syllabus. And secondly, I would say that uh, the pattern also could develop something based on the project based. That is, you give certain projects to the children, ask them to help and explain them and develop the project on those, on those aspects. So this would be my idea, like to develop an academic or to bridge the gap among the academic efficiency. This is the pattern. See, uh, even the hybrid model uh, will help you to improve the soft skills development. See, for example, a project is given to a team of students. Uh, it helps them to develop their soft skills part. Because what is project ultimately? What is soft skill? Soft skill is something like wherein you have to have a communication, wherein you have to have team spirit, logical ability of the skill, logical skills of the children should be developed, etc. I think it's all can be corrective into a one system called project based development. And I think this process of evaluation will help us to bridge the academic proficiency. And secondly, I would say that as the other two uh, eminent speakers have spoken, the building of quality of education in form of training to the teachers. Uh, we really lack a proper training to the teachers is my opinion, because each one of us recruit a different teacher, teachers as they come in, we see the basic qualification, but how much are they eligible to teach through the pedagogies of our school system or a common school curriculum system is lacking. So. Again, I would suggest or insist more uh, efficiently is on the common teaching methodologies, uh, the training uh, patterns to the teachers should be evaluated and should be properly executed by any common governing body or anything. And thirdly, I would suggest that in my opinion may, it is the involvement of uh, parents into the school system. It's a collaborative work. It has to be done with parents because when, we we as school principals we get people or students walking in from different schools from different states and ultimately what we see is the report card that is when i take a student into my school who is coming from different school of different state i see a report card uh, which will majorly mean only that a or b or c so that would be the marking systems mentioned on the report card but but with that what will i judge what will i judge the student so when I fight as A, what is that A level means? So I mean that uh, we also should have a grading system. It is more feedback generated. Instead of just mentioning it as A, B, C, it could be something like the child is good in this aspect. The child has to improve in this aspect. I would hope you're getting me. That is, if I'm judging them in the reading scale or a writing scale, it should be more specific generated report card system. That is, it should be like something like I, my, the child is lacking in this, the child requires more proficiency into this, the child should be trained into this aspect, et cetera. So this type of feedback of grading system also helps the other schools or the other areas tell that exactly where the child is lagging and where should we start from. So that will be more easy to adapt the child into the other, another school system. Also, this helps the parents. Now, I was just trying to tell to the parent. Parent also will know where the child is lagging and where to improve and which type of the school to go on to, et cetera. So uh, I think that these aspects will help to build, uh, bridge the gap uh, between the what is lagging actually as an academic proficiency or the soft skills proficiency lagging areas. So these are my inputs into that uh, point. <laughs>
Thank you. So, what you mentioned was like the common teaching methodology and a common board, and and mostly the grading system needs to be uh, more micromanaged. It, it yes. Should be more depth. Should have more of a depth. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the input. Thank you. Uh, if Thank I you. can come to Vikas director uh, next. Uh, sorry, if you can please switch on your camera. Very good evening, sir. Yeah. Good evening, Gagori, ma'am. Good evening, sir. So your uh, inputs on the topic, please. And I have one particular question for you. Yeah. Uh, is that uh, the, the family backgrounds of the kids? Uh, the, do, do, does it really uh, influence the educational gap between schools? Yeah, definitely. I prepared certain points, and when I heard uh, Mr. Burek, so he was talking at the national level, and then Mr. Yes. Bhattacharya ji, he spoke on international level. So I thought that I should speak on ground level, Absolutely. the basic thing, because our topic uh, in reality it was the educational gap between schools, yes, and uh, educational gap has certain uh, reasons, certain factors which I think so. Uh, the first thing should be location of the school, where the school is located. That is the first factor I feel like. If the school is located in a city. it has different environment if a school is located in a rural area it has a different environment then the second factor comes up faculty though i will be coming to your topic also you were talking about the family i will be coming to that point only then the second thing is faculty as uh, mr burek said that the paying structure that is the salary structure varies from school to school and if we are giving a higher salary structure to a employee that is a teacher we get a good teacher and if we go to the rural areas a good teacher never wants to go to rural area because of the traveling distance though the school is ready to pay a higher salary but they think that we will be in the city so faculty becomes the second reason the third thing which comes up to your point that is the environment and the parents in cities most of the time we find that the parents are aware the parents are educated and the parents are ready to go for the educational field of their child in rural areas though they have a very good paying capacity they are financially rich they have a bigger than bigger of land or acres of land with a big cultivational area but as far as the educational side comes so they keep it at the last in their family budget they go for other things in a first form then they think of the payment of fees and going to the schools so the environment affects a lot so uh, this is one of the reason and what we should do is to bridge up this gap that location can't be changed if a school is in rural area we can't change the location we can't carry that school to the city as far as the teachers are concerned the faculty is concerned we can't carry the teachers of city to the rural areas but yes we can take them for particular days and conduct some training programs so that they can share their technology with the rural teachers and the rural teachers can adopt those methodologies and the students may be benefited but at last now i come to your thing that the parents should be ready to adopt everything that is the first aspect i'll just share one example uh, it was a real incident of my own school when i joined a particular school i said अपने बच्चे को यूनिफॉर्म में भेज दिए सेंड योर चाइल्ड इन प्रॉपर स्कूल यूनिफॉर्म सो द पेरेंट्स सिंपली सेड आपको कपड़ों को पढ़ाना है मेरे बच्चे को पढ़ाना है लाइक यू वांट टू टीच माय चाइल्ड और माय चिल्ड्रन क्लोथ्स सो इट हार्डली मैटर्स वेदर माय चाइल्ड इज कमिंग इन यूनिफॉर्म और नॉट यू जस्ट कंसेंट्रेट ऑन इज टीचिंग सो दैट इज द थिंग हाउ वी हैव टू मोल्ड द पेरेंट्स टू एक्सेप्ट दो थिंग्स but now if we talk of the educational difference educational gap now there is some difference in our education system also how it is different like if we talk of cbsc i will talk of cbsc at school level only i will not go to college level and higher studies but at cbsc level a child studying in rural area and a child studying in big metro city maybe delhi bombay calcutta metros both the students are having different resources different infrastructure facilities in the schools but at the end of the year when the result is declared both the students get 100 of 100 in a particular subject so do we feel that both of them must be having the same knowledge i don't think so 
because it was a limitation of the syllabus and both the students managed to grasp that syllabus and they scored the same marks according to the third person they will find that yes mr x who was from rural area mr y who was from city area both of them have scored 100 but if they go for an interview and the presentation of their selves to the authorities who are taking the interview i think the city uh, boy will be selected maybe because of his appearance maybe because of his spoken language maybe because of his confidence level so these are some of the things where we should concentrate and motivate the parents train the teachers in the rural areas and divert the parents towards academic side of the children until and unless they get mentally prepared we will not be able to bridge up this gap though the schools will try to provide each and every facility just like a city the teachers will try to do their best but will the parents be ready to accept it that is a big issue so in earlier days parents were ready to accept whatever decisions were taken by the schools whether a child was punished or not whether the child was given a hard punishment or a soft punishment the parents were ready but nowadays it is not acceptable in cities as well as in rural areas so it is very difficult for the teachers and the schools to make their things applicable and the students should get those things it is a difficult thing then in earlier days the students were reading more and more of text but nowadays everyone wants a shortcut they don't purchase a textbook they try to purchase a sample book a model book or 10 years or question bank and with a limited knowledge they want to score maximum so these are certain factors where we have to change the adaptability and thought process of the parents as well as the students then only these gaps can be covered up and as mr buret was saying that the resources are better in city areas metro cities in the schools so that helps in the overall development of a child as we call it a co curricular activity in rural areas they only concentrate on the education part very rare debates very rare competitions because they don't stick to all those things but if we talk of the cities they get all these exposures along with studies so they get a better environment in the schools as compared to the rural area then mr buret was saying government schools and private schools government schools and private schools that is correct but in government schools the teachers are paid salary at a fixed remuneration output is not concerned in private sector we have to prove our worth then only we will survive then only we will continue our services other will otherwise we will have to quit but in government area they know they will get the salary whether they do good or bad so they are not interested so always private sector will perform better so these are some of the things and i would just add on uh, two three more points uh, it is like faculty i have talked about environment i have talked about board exams i have talked about i have talked about the co curricular activities and lastly i would say that training of the teachers adaptability of the parents this should be done and when we were talking of uh, um, bhattacharya ji was talking about uk so uh, obviously when we talk of european countries i have seen the books of ib curriculum i have seen the books of cbsc and i have seen the books of icsc as well if you see any book of ib curriculum the books are designed in such a way as we have the books of primary classes colorful text with big bold character sizes but in our cbsc or in indian education system whether it is any state board the text is very dense content is too much and then only if we learn if we read 10 lines we will learn two three if we are learning only three lines then how we will write three so that becomes one thing so that was a good thing uh, to discuss the topic is very big uh, a big gap the only thing that we should discuss here on this platform is that how the bridge the gap can be bridged up yes, and that can be yeah that that can be done as i said earlier and you raised the question also to me that we have to change the thought process of the families whether it can be done through workshops 
whether okay. it can be done through some motivational lectures or we can show them some videos of some good schools the activities done in some good schools in big cities and then we can motivate them to see these things are happening in those schools we want to follow the same things in our school also we need your help we need your child to be at the same level as the other school students are doing don't only concentrate on marks as uh, mrs krishna said no sorry uh, this lady said that uh, we are just running for a grade b grade c grade that is true people are just watching the grade and as i said that 100 marks a child from rural area the same 100 marks a child from city area has scored but are they performing at the same level i don't think so so this race of marks should be stopped the overall development of a child should be seen and this thing should be inspired in the thought process of the parents that yes your child should be overall well so this is all what i wanted to say uh, thank you once again uh, for giving me this opportunity to be a panelist and maybe that i have come up to your expectations with these words so thank you so much gogori ma'am thank you thank you thank you so much sir it was absolutely wonderful hearing from you i would like to close the discussion here uh, i would like to thank both the panelists here and call back ochin for the vote of thanks please so i think really a wonderful discussion on a very uh, relevant and contemporary topic but sir thank you as always and in, in fact i would like all of you to know that this wonderful topic that we discussed today was suggested by bharat sir it's his branch act so i think uh, thank you so much sir for uh, for uh, you know suggesting this topic and also i think uh, some some very relevant facts you mentioned but above all what i really uh, admire is your observation that children who have done tremendously well and today who are flag bearers of our education system around the globe the fact that many of them have not come from only marky institutions but also from uh, rural areas also from you know uh, underprivileged uh, you know uh, backgrounds government schools who didn't get the best of facilities but have done very well for themselves so that acknowledgement really and that has been from someone who has headed one of the best premier academic institutions in the country speaks volumes about courage and honesty thank you so thank i think you, uh, thank you very much thank you so much sir uh, madhavi ma'am uh, thank you so much for gracing the platform for, for being with us here the evening thank you thank you sir thank you for giving me this opportunity <laughs> pleasure, i hope i met the expectation <laughs> uh, sure sure of course you, you did ma'am Uh, we all benefited from your experience, and I think two few very relevant things you mentioned, including uh, and these are very practical and relevant ideas, like uh, standardizing the teacher training part, common teaching methodologies, grading system. I think very very important. Uh, these are issues that indeed we live with. Now uh, to make it more uh, feedback focused, more relevant, more transparent, especially at times uh, not only uh, in this context but also at times when a child you know, is transferred from one school to the other. Maybe the family shifts from one city to the other, one state to other, one board to other. So definitely, those uh, those circumstances definitely this will help. It will go a long distance. Yeah, these I are the practical problems we as principals face every time. I agree. I agree. Yeah. I completely agree. I completely agree. Uh, thank you so much for that, uh, Vikas sir. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for gracing the platform for being with us here today. And indeed, that's some of the points you mentioned are very very relevant, especially your example of uh, a parent. uh coming back to you to ask whether you are teaching my child or his uh, uniform you know, these are these are actually indeed uh, on the ground practical issues and i'm sure as esteemed principals and educators the way you deal with this is so important so indeed role of esteemed principals in in nation building esteemed teachers in nation building is second to none i honestly believe that and some great points you mentioned including the importance of location faculty best practice sharing and also the role of parents how important it is for them to be flexible to adapt so i think that is that is really important so all we had a great session i also thank members of the audience for being with us uh, here today evening and i look forward to your continued support in the sessions to come thank, thank you. you take care and goodbye thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you thank you thank you everyone thank you